Isn't it though? It is about him and what he's done. And there's nothing we can do to say thank you. But the thing that he says is that we can partner with him in what he's doing on this planet. And it's through the giving of our tithes and offerings that we have the chance to do that. The ushers are coming forward. If you're a guest, please don't feel pressured. We just want you to be here and enjoy this presence in this place this day. But your uh, communication cards, your tithes and offerings, your special offering for faith comes by hearing. Let's uh, give with grateful, thankful hearts. Father, indeed it is with a grateful, thankful heart that we do give you this day. And may you, as you've done so many times, use our gifts so that you can be uh, spread and furthered in this community, around this world. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. This little song we're about to do was uh, born on October the 8th. It was the weekend of ladies' retreat. Nancy was gone at the retreat, so I was home alone. And super busy, had this big list of mental, mental list of things I was going to get done that day. And nowhere in that list was there anything about writing a song. So it was completely unexpected. It was a pleasant surprise. I was trying to watch the Nebraska-Ohio State football game. And instead, I had these words in my head. And I remember writing them down. And uh, I looked at them, and I thought, well, that's going to be tough to put a melody to. So I set them aside and thought, well, I'll come back to it in a few days, a few weeks, whatever, you know. And about 10 minutes later, this little melody popped in my head, and I thought, well, that's really different. <laughs> so I had to get the guitar out and see what it was all about. And the game got forgotten about. And uh, the song, and then I spent time just in worship after that. And uh, I couldn't come up with the name, so I did what any smart man does at that point. I asked my wife to name it, and she decided the cross is always true. So the cross is always true. I remember as a child when I first heard the story of how Jesus Christ died for me. My mother, she'd read me the old, old stories and tell me how she came to believe. And she told me she prayed that the day would come when I would find my way to the cross. She said, lean on that cross, hold on to that cross. When your life seems too hard to walk through Hope on that cross Accept the love from that cross It's the cross that will always be true The cross that will always be true As the years went by, through laughter and tears, her words came back over and over again. I read the stories for myself, and after trials and failures, I saw the way to believe. I got down on my knees, and I prayed that sinner's prayer. And I found my way to the cross Now I lean on that cross Hold on to that cross And when my life seems too hard to walk through I hope on that cross Feel the love from that cross It's the cross that will always be true Oh, the cross that will always When the time came that I had kids of my own, I told them the story of how Christ died for them. I sat down and read them the old, old stories 
And I told him how I came to believe And I told him I prayed that the day would come When they would find their way to the cross I told him lean on that cross Hold on to that cross And when your life seems too hard to walk through Hope on that cross Accept the love from that cross It's the cross that will always be true Oh, the cross that will always be true If you haven't found your way, don't delay Oh, the cross is there waiting for you. And you can lean on that cross, hold on to that cross, when your life seems too hard to walk through. Hope on that cross, accept the love from that cross. It's the cross that will always be true. Yes, it's the cross that will always be true. Thank you, Bruce, for not watching that football game. <laughs> I, I normally, uh, I normally don't um, want to single out people that are with us for the first time, but I feel like I ought to this morning. Uh, Wyatt Eugene Arnold is here with mom and dad, Caleb and Stephanie. He was born 10 days ago. Is he, is he, is he, am I going to disrupt you if, if you show him off? I know I didn't tip you off and you, you can, you can uh, slap me after the service for, for, for what I did, but I just, when, when parents are here with their newborn for the first time, we need to celebrate that. This is one of ours, and so congratulations to Caleb and Stephanie on the birth of their little boy. That's, that's, that's great for, uh. Start them out right early, I say. You bet. You bet. Um, this morning, I want to talk with you about uh, something that, uh, as I've been reflecting and thinking and, and dreaming about the future that, that God has for, for Lakeside, this is something that's been kind of lurking in the back of my mind. Uh, Angie and I have been here for... Uh, for 10 weeks now. It's been in the back of our mind for that entire time. In fact, it's been stirring since before, before we arrived. As I recall, it was back in the month of May, right before Memorial Day, where Angie and I came to, to Hastings to meet with your church board and, and discuss the possibilities of partnering together. And, and this was something that emerged even during that, that conversation. And uh, trying to go back and, and relive that, if our memory serves me right, um, when we moved into a time of, uh, of questions and answers during the formal interview process that we had with the church board, uh, this was the thrust of the very first question um, that was asked of us. And so that led me to believe, you know, this is a live issue. This is something that, that needs to be uh, dealt with. This is one that needs to be addressed if we're going to sense the leading of God to come here and, and serve within this body of believers. And, and certainly uh, nothing's happened during the time that I've been here that's done anything to diminish or temper my sense that uh, this is something that needs to be given some attention. And so this morning I want to do that. It, I, I, it's, it's not a new topic to you. It's one that's been the source of uh, conversations in the past. I know it was raised... Uh, Two or, two or three times during the interim or the pastoral transition process. But this morning, I, I want to talk about the destiny of, of this church and uh, you know, what, what I believe God, God wants Lakeside to become in the, in the months and years to come and some of the steps that I believe we need to take in the near future that will allow us to move in, in that direction. And so as we begin, let me, let me preface all this um, by sharing two or three observations that, that can kind of uh, form a little bit of context for us. 
observation number one is that, that I believe, for the most part, Lakeside's a healthy church. Amen. I believe Lakeside's a healthy church. I, I don't think Lakeside's a perfect church. Um, no church is. Um, you know, you may have been perfect till you got me, but, but you know, <laughs> the, that, that, that sunk you. Uh, Lakeside's a healthy church. And, and when, when I say that, uh, there's, there's you know, four or five things that, 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 that caused me to reach that conclusion. I, I don't sense there's, there, there's, there's high-level infighting and, 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 and bickering that, that's going on. I, I don't sense there are, there, there are factions that are vying for control or, or camps of people that are, that, that are trying to implement their agenda over and above what's best for the church as a whole or what's in the interest of the common good. I don't sense there's a breakdown in trust between the church uh, family and, and the church board, the official leadership. I believe that this church trusts the people that they placed in, in, in those decision-making places to make godly, God-honoring decisions. Um, I, I sense, by and large, that, that most of us feel uh, good about our church to where we'd be comfortable inviting a neighbor or a friend or a co-worker to, to join us for a worship service or for a church activity. Um, you know, we feel that what happens here, by and large, has, has, has value for our lives, would be meaningful to them. In other words, if, if, you were to, if you were to sit there and take the chance of inviting someone to, to come and join you for a Sunday morning service or for a church activity of, of some point, say, hey, hey, come to church with me and I'll take you out to lunch afterwards. If you were to do that, chances are you would not have to spend the entire lunch time apologizing and saying, I am so sorry that you had to sit through that. And you have probably been at churches where that thought has been in your mind in the past. Lakeside's a healthy church. We're not thinking those kinds of thoughts, and that's a, that's a sign of health. Second thing, I believe healthy things grow. It is the nature of healthy things to grow. You know, if a newborn baby doesn't put on weight, doctors eventually get concerned that something's wrong with that child. You know, if we put a, a shrub or a tree in the ground and that shrub or that tree never gets any larger, we, we begin to wonder if, if something's wrong. Healthy things grow. It, it's true in all of life. It, it's true in, in, in business. If you're in business and you're providing a quality product at a fair price and you're meeting a need in the marketplace and taking care of your customers, your business should grow because healthy things grow. It's true in our relationships. If we've got a healthy relationship with somebody and we relate to each other in healthy ways, the sense of love and connection that we have with that person will grow over the course of time because healthy things grow. It's true with, with, uh, with investments. If we use our money wisely and make wise financial decisions, our, our bank account will grow. Our, our net worth will grow. I mean, it is true in virtually all of life. It's true virtually across the board. Healthy things grow. Which leads me to this, the third thing that I want to share with you this morning is I am amazed at the fact that this church has grown to the level that it has, giving the facility constraints that we have. Our facility is a very nice facility, but as we all know, it's a very small facility. Um, the fact that this facility can serve a congregation that is right at the 250-person threshold, in, in, uh, it's amazing to me given the space constraints we've got. We, you know, we get over 200 people in this room on a Sunday morning, and it feels pretty, pretty, uh, pretty tight in here. I saw the, the sign back there said capacity 402, and I said somebody was smoking something when they came up with that. <laughs> no way. I mean, you get, you get 200 people in here, and it feels kind of crowded. We need, our, we need our space. We get a little bit claustrophobic. Um, here about three or four weeks ago on a Wednesday night, we had... Uh, we had 18 elementary age kids in one of those small classrooms down this hallway. Susan was in there. You know what it was like. Yeah. Um, 
We've had as many, 20, as many as 20 teens and sponsors in their double classroom down the hallway over here. And, and, and folks, that's crowded. It's amazing to me that we have grown to the level that we've grown given um, the space constraints we've got. We, we've, we really have no space to speak of for adult education. We, we have no additional office space. If we were to expand our staff, we'd have no room where we could really office those people and, and give them a place to where they could work during the week. We, we need room. Um, and I think another thing, I said that healthy things grow, but another thing about healthy things is when they encounter obstacles that restrict or inhibit their growth, that, that they'll eventually shrink back and decline. They'll, they'll accommodate to the obstacles that are around them. When, when they run into resistance, eventually the growth will shut down. And, and the church board, as, as, as we've been looking at the attendance patterns of, of Lakeside over the past few years, they've kind of noticed this trend that, that, will, that will peak and then back away, and will peak and then will back away, and will push the limits and then will back away from that threshold. And that's going to continue probably until we get more space. And there's a couple of ways that we can go about getting more space. One way, an obvious way, and certainly a viable option, is we can expand our facility. And we need to think about that. But I can tell you that's one that'll take quite a bit of time and one that'll take quite a bit of finances to pull off. Or a second way that we can do it is we can double use the space we have. And we can adjust our schedule and adjust our church programming in ways that will allow us to get more mileage out of the space that we're currently operating within. And given that, for one thing, the need's immediate. I mean, it's, we're dealing with capacity issues now. It's not a matter of saying, okay, we're growing at this rate, and then we can see that in 12 to 18 months we're going to need space. We're, we're there. We're, we're there. The need's immediate. Given that, and then given, secondly, that the cost associated with the facility expansion um, would likely result in us having to take on considerable debt. And typically when you take on debt, it comes at the expense of ministry. Um, given those realities, it's the belief of your church's leadership team that we should lay the groundwork for a transition to double services in early 2012, that we need to seize the momentum of where we are as a church right now, and we need to move on this, and we need to move on it sooner rather than later. So with that in mind, I just want to let you know that we are planning, beginning Sunday, February 5th of next year, um, to adjust our Sunday morning schedule and to move to a double service arrangement. And I realize in saying that, that there are probably as many questions going around in your heads as there are people in this room. I, I, I get, how's it going to work? What are we going to do about this? And, and, and all that. And, and I, I know I can't possibly hope to answer all the questions that are floating around in your heads in the time we've got left. So what we've done, and, and uh, we've prepared a document. Those of you that are up front can see it. It says FAQ sheet. FAQ stands for Frequently Asked Questions. And we've tried to put this document together. It's available at the Guest Center. We've got 100 copies of it out there, so certainly one for every individual or, or certainly for every family. Uh, we, we've got that. You can pick that up, and, and that will spell out in detail what it is we have in mind, uh, what, what it is we're planning, hopefully address what this change will mean for you, what this change will mean for us as a whole, as a church. Uh, let me try to briefly capsulize it and, and let the FAQ sheet fill in the, 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 the gaps or the, the, the details. What we're looking at doing involves creating two identical worship services on Sunday mornings that each runs about 75 minutes in length. One would begin at 9 o'clock, and the other would begin at 1045. We'd have a 30-minute transition time in between. And, and there's certain logistics with this that we frankly haven't worked through yet. We're, we're kind of on the front end, but the board said we need to let the church family know that this is where we're going, and so that's why I'm, uh, I'm sharing with you. As part of the reason that we're waiting until February to launch a venture like this is to work through some of those details, to try to think through and solve as many of the issues as we can in advance before we, before we get there. But that's the broad brushstroke picture uh, of what it is we've got in mind. 
And so again, please pick up that FAQ sheet, um, take it home, look at it. Um, if there's questions on it that you don't think we've answered or addressed, there's an email address and you can drop us an email and say, hey, have you thought about this or what does it mean for this? And we'll try to, to get back with that information to you and, and, and help give you a picture of what we've got in mind and help it come into better focus. But, but, but to me, as, as I've been thinking about this and living with this for, for a while now, to me, a whole lot more important than the logistics and the mechanics of how it's going to work is the mindset and the mentality that we as a church bring to it. Uh, more, more important than how it's going to play out from a, from a scheduling standpoint is the reason why we're doing it. And, and, and so I want to spend the balance of our time together looking and, and thinking and, and, and sharing about that. And, and let me just try to boil it down to three statements. Number one, the primary reason that we're doing this and the primary reason why I, as a pastor, believe we should, as a church, go this direction, it flows out of one of my fundamental core convictions as it relates to the nature and the purpose of the church, and it's this. I believe the church is not meant to exist for itself. It is meant to exist for the world around the church is not to be an enterprise that is governed primarily by the interests and the comforts and the preferences of those of us that are on the inside. This is part of the genius of the church. This is an element that sets the church of Jesus Christ apart from any other endeavor in the history of the, the world. Is that The church is not meant to be insider focused. It is meant to exist primarily for the benefit of those that don't belong to it. It is not meant to be a retreat or an escape from the world so much as it is to be a gift and a blessing to the world. The calling of the church is to be the agent of the work of Jesus in our world in this day. Through the power of his Holy Spirit, we are to be there to be a gift to the world. A friend of mine a few years ago summarized it this way. Another way to think about it is to consider the difference between a cruise ship and a corner clinic. Cruise ships, many of us know, have been on cruises, or have, if you're my age, you watched The Love Boat back in the 80s. <laughs> you know, a cruise ship is a vessel that, that has all sorts of uh, happenings and activities and seminars and shows and restaurants so that those that are on board and those that are footing the bill can have a pleasant and enjoyable trip. That's what a cruise ship's about. And, and, and when you think about the church in North America, I imagine a lot of pastors probably feel like they're spiritual cruise ship directors. They, they, they're trying to put this program in place that's geared toward the interests of those that are on board, that'll meet with their approval, that will keep complaints to a minimum, that will preserve their happiness for as long as it is that they're on that boat. I don't think the church is to be a cruise ship. I believe God means for his church to be the corner clinic. And the corner clinic is a place where those that are hurting and those that are diseased and those that are in need of healing can find help and hope and health. A place where people can walk in and they can be serviced regardless of how banged up they are, regardless of how nauseating their symptoms might be, where they can be loved and serviced and brought back to health and be transmitted out better than they were when they came in. That's what the church is supposed to be. And, and, and what does it say? What does it say? What does it say to somebody when they walk in and they see a crowded facility that doesn't have a lot of space available. Now, now hopefully, it says, it says some good things. Hopefully, it says there's something worthwhile going on here. That there's something exciting. There's something, that there's something engaging happening. And, and, and that's a good thing. But I fear, I fear it also says, we don't have room for you. There, there's not a place for you here. And folks, that is not a message I ever want to send to anybody. Never. 
And so it's with that in mind that, that I believe we need to do whatever we can to make sure that that message is not being transmitted. And I believe that us making this transition to double services will help us do that. It, it will say to people in our community, we value you. We esteem you. There's a place for you in this family. That's the message that needs to be going out from Lakeside to our community. And I believe that transitioning to double services will help us do a better job of sending that message to this community. Second thing, as I think about this transition, if it's going to be successful, there's a sense in which all of us need to step up and embrace it. And that means, that means a number of things. It means we need to be flexible. It means we need to be adaptable. It means we need to not grumble and complain while we're working out some of the kinks. And there will be kinks in those. It means we need to set our preferences aside in the interest of reaching the world around us. In the interest of impacting the lives of people that have got a messed up concept of God. They've been hurt in the past by the church. That means some of us need to be willing to serve in some ways that, that, that we're not currently serving, that we need to expand our volunteer base. It means that for all of us, we need to leverage the relationships God's placed in our lives and take responsibility for growing the church by trying to fill in some of the seats that we'll be creating by worshiping twice. It means we need to do everything we can to maintain a spirit of togetherness and of unity and cooperation as we go forward. As I've thought about this, in some ways, a transition like this is, is one that uh, it's, it's not something that we merely do in, in, uh, in hopes of attracting people from our community, but it's also a test of us. It really is. It's a test of us. It's, 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 it's a way of, of, of gauging whether we're focused on the right things to where stuff doesn't become a distraction. Trivial stuff, piddly stuff, little stuff. Are, are, are we focused on the right things? Are, are, are we seeing the big picture to our impacting the lives of people around us as driving our decisions? Are we prioritizing the right things? Are we placing emphasis where emphasis ought to be placed? It's a test of us. I want to share with you something a pastor friend of mine said to me probably 15 years ago. I don't even remember the setting in which he said it, but it's one of those statements that when you hear it, you, you ever had something that somebody said something to you and it just locks onto you with such force that you sit there and say, I'm never going to forget that. This was one of those, this was one of those statements. Uh, he, he shared it with me and, and, it's, and it's been a part of my life. He said, John, a church can grow no more than people's willingness to be uncomfortable. Think about that. A church can grow no more than our willingness to be uncomfortable. And if we are primarily concerned about what's easy for us or what's comfortable for us, we will cap our ability to grow. And the reason we will is because we won't be willing to make sacrifices. And so that's when I talk about stepping up across the board. That, that, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. The, the, the transition that we're, that we're looking at and, and planning for, it's only going to be successful as we each determine that we're going to do the little things that need to be done that'll make something like this that has the potential to be very disruptive. We're going to say, we're not going to let it be disruptive. We're going to make it successful. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. If the transition's going to be successful, we need to all step up and embrace it. And then third, one final thing. I believe that there is no growth apart from doing something new. Or let me say it this way, maybe. The kind of thinking and the kind of activity that got us to a certain place will not get us to the next level because if it would get us to the next level, we would have already gotten there. Does that make sense? 
To, to get someplace we've not been, we've got to do something we've not done before. And I want to share with you another statement that somebody shared with me a few years back. Another one of those kind of I'll never forget it statements. Actually, it's not a statement, it's a question. The guy asked me, John, when was the last time you did something for the first time? And I, I heard that question that kind of startled me. I really didn't know what he was trying to get after, but he said, John, think of it this way. If you're not doing anything new, if you're not doing anything for the first time, you're not growing. And the only way to grow and to stretch is by doing something you've never done before. And I go, you know, he's dead on right. And, and, and there is a part of me, there is a part of me that would love this morning, as I think about this, this transition, there was a part of me that would love to get up and share with you and, and, and say, you know, I, I've been in ministry for 25 years now, and I've been a part of two or three churches that have successfully made this transition, and just follow me, and we'll get there, and we'll be fine. But I can't say that. Because this is an issue that, frankly, as a pastoral leader, I've, I've, I've never faced before. I've, I've dealt with a lot of other challenges and a lot of other issues, but I've not dealt with the issue of transitioning a church from a single worship experience to a double services. And, and frankly, there's a part of me that is a bit scared at that prospect, but the greater part of me is really excited about the opportunity for growth God. That, that, is, that is inherent in that. We're going someplace we've not gone before. And we're going to grow by doing that. I'm going to grow. In fact, what I believe is going to happen is that the growth of the church is going to mirror the growth that's going to be taking place in each of our hearts and lives as we do something together we've not done before. And as we stretch and as we learn, as we grow, because of doing something unfamiliar, that's going to cause us to more fully trust in God. And, and when we more fully trust in God, the church will begin to increase and grow and expand. And, and it'll compel us to rely on Him even more. And it'll be this cycle that I believe that the surrounding community, people in the surrounding community are going to come to rely on God and place their trust in Him and experience the transformative power of the gospel in their lives because we're committed to growing and doing something we've not done before. And I realize, let me wrap up with this, I realize I'm not a long-time resident of Hastings. I've been here two and a half months. Still got an Oklahoma driver's license. <laughs> Still got Oklahoma tags on our car. And if you work at the county courthouse, please do not turn us in. We'll get that done eventually. <laughs> You know, I, I'm still trying to learn your names. You know, one of, the, one of the questions when we, you know, run into people at, at Walmart and people, am I your pastor? You know, because I, I, don't, I don't know who you all are yet. <laughs> but, but I also, I also think by virtue of being a, a newcomer, there's something to be said about having fresh eyes. And, and, and let me tell you something that I've become convinced of, something that I believe from the bottom of my heart based on the fresh eyes that, that, that I bring to this place. This community needs a church like Lakeside. Hastings needs a church like this. This community needs a church where people worship authentically. This community needs a church where, 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 where folks manifest the accepting grace of Jesus, where you're accepted when you come in. This community needs a church that has an optimistic theology like ours has, the belief that God has never encountered a life so soiled and depraved that he can't change it and transform it if given the chance. This community needs a church that's vibrant and full of life. It needs a church that truly welcomes the presence of God in their midst. It needs a church like this. But the only way it will ever happen is if we determine, 
that we are going to sacrifice and we are going to give of ourselves to create space so that some folks that are looking for something genuine and real can find a place where they can land and they can encounter the God that we've come to know. And I am convinced that us transitioning to double services is part of what needs to happen so that that can take place. Is it going to be easy? No. Is it at times going to be frustrating and inconvenient? Yes. But I believe it is going to be worth it. But I also believe it will only be worth it is if we all have the right mindset. If we're all willing to step up. And if we are all going to remain focused truly on what is most important. God so loved the world. Not the church, the world. That he sent his one and only son. Folks, I'm looking forward to a journey. Let's take it together. Amen. And let's see what God does as we do it. Can you stand with me for a final prayer? <laughs> Father, I know I believe it and I've heard it so many times from people here that we are on the cusp of some really good stuff. That for weeks, months, years, you've been preparing us and readying us for such a time as this. And Father, we want to seize this opportunity and leverage it so that your kingdom can get the maximum possible benefit. So Father, I pray that you would go with us and guide us. You know where we are, you know the things of... Uh, that are yet to be decided. You know the challenges. You're the God of the past, the present, the future, and we're kind of stuck to where we are right now. So would you lead us? Would you go before us? And would you work within all of our hearts to where we can truly go there together and unified and as a body? Father, thank you. Thank you for entrusting us with this community. And may we prove faithful as we remain obedient and faith-filled. Father, thank you for this day as well, for the sense of your presence that's rested upon us as we've been in this room. We pray that we might take a measure of it with us so that people can see Jesus in us. And we'll give you praise and thanks for any good that comes from it. Because it's in his name we ask. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here. Please make your way by the guest center, the FAQ sheets, also the military Bible stick. If you want to see what one of those looks like, you're welcome to do that. Have a great, great day. See you, friends.